Good evening and welcome. I'm Steve Donovan, the Director of Alumni Relations at Trinity College. We hope you and your loved ones continue to remain well and safe during these very troubling times. We're pleased tonight to bring you another virtual long walk event, the fourth one we've done in recent weeks. Thanks to those of you who have participated in these. And for those who haven't, they are archived on the virtual long walk website which you can find on the front page of the college's website, trincall.edu. The programs have been fascinating, which shouldn't be a surprise knowing the collective accomplishments of Trinity alumni and parents. We have a few more scheduled on the next two Thursdays that you won't want to miss either. Next Thursday, we'll be joined by two giants in the hospitality and restaurant industry, Danny Meyer from the class of 80 and David Chang from the class of 99, who will be interviewed by another accomplished fellow alum, John Molnar from the class of 85. And the following Thursday, legendary Trinity faculty member Rennie Falco will join us to talk about federalism and who gets to lead in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with Owen Tripp from the class of 01, whose vision and entrepreneurship has become even more impactful in the midst of the pandemic. And because she did such a wonderful job interviewing Matthew Prince last week, we've invited President Joanne Berger Sweeney back to interview Owen. So it's now my pleasure to turn the show over to President Berger Sweeney. Thank you so much, Steve. I wonder though, with your introduction, whether you mean if I do a really bad job of this interview, I never have to do them again. It, was that what you were suggesting? <laughs> I know that. You're, 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 okay. you're the, you're the, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Um, thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to the entire Trinity community for joining us for this very special event. And thank you, Owen Tripp, for being our guest. I am grateful that we can come together as a community today. This past week, has been incredibly difficult for our country, for many of us as individuals. And I can assure you as an African-American woman, it is very challenging for me to grapple with some of these critical questions that people are asking about race, justice, and our sense of personal safety. I'm particularly happy to be able to have this opportunity today to speak with you, Owen, because I think healthcare is one of those issues where race, justice, and personal safety come together. And so this feels like a particularly important and timely topic for us to take up today. Tonight's conversation in one way is what we can do in higher education to further the work towards justice. Because at the basis of justice, I think is education and opportunity. And those are two of the things that we're able to do here at Trinity College. Now, as for Owen, four years ago, Forbes magazine declared, Owen Tripp's Grand Rounds is on a mission to revolutionize healthcare. Today, in the midst of a pandemic, we're honored to have Owen with us to discuss this explosive growth in e-medicine and I do wonder how many of our callers today have used e-medicine within the last two months, perhaps who had never known what it was or used it before then. We're gonna try and cover quite a bit of ground in this next hour. We're going to discuss e-medicine in the time of COVID. We're gonna talk about Owen being a successful entrepreneur and thought leader. And then finally, I will ask Owen about the role that Trinity College played 
in the adventure, at least thus far. So for a few words of introduction about Owen. As a co-founder and CEO of Grand Rounds, Owen believes that patients will achieve better healthcare outcomes through the intersection of technology, medical expertise, and extraordinary patient care. Prior to Grand Rounds, Owen co-founded Reputation.com and, and grew the company into the worldwide leader in online reputation and privacy management. He also held leadership positions at eBay and Accenture. Owen received a BA with honors from Trinity in 2001 and received an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's been recognized among the World Economic Forum's Global Technology Pioneers, Goldman Sachs Top 50 Builders Plus Innovators, and Rock Health's Most Beloved CEO. He is a native of Massachusetts and the son of a doctor and an educator. Owen is married to Kimberly and together they have three children. So welcome Owen. And maybe let's start with just a little bit of your story and why you've decided to take up healthcare as your primary focus right now, healthcare and technology. Yeah, so good to see you, Joanne. Thanks for inviting me for this conversation. Um, you know, if my mom were sitting here, maybe she's maybe she's even dialed in, who knows? She would make sure that I corrected you. I'm the son of two doctors. One is a medical doctor. The one or the other one is a doctor of education. And huh. so huh. that is actually a start of that is a start of an answer to the question you asked, which is kind of what <laughs> brought me to you. healthcare. And um, you know, I said I was both I was so inspired by how my parents viewed their careers as helping people. Mm -hmm. and sort of the intellectual rigor with which they approach that task. Um, and so uh, we'll get to this later, but when I was thinking about what to do after reputation.com, it was either I can try to uh, help on education or help on healthcare. And I said, and I think you'll appreciate this, education's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try healthcare. No, I, I, um, I, uh, my, my story in healthcare is actually um, reasonably long. But let's let's go back before that. I, I did grow up in Acton, Massachusetts, as you as you mentioned, um, and uh, I went to boarding high school at Andover. And um, Trinity hit my radar in my junior year at Andover. Um, I remember my first visit to campus vividly. Um, I remember the smells, the feels. I loved Andover. What I saw in Trinity was a similar sort of accessible footprint, beautiful architecture, absolutely conducive to great learning but it was in a city, which is something I really wanted. And I wanted to be around a city. I wanted to be around um, people who were working in industry and thinking about government. And I, and I sort of love that fusion of the best in, in residential campus life, as well as accessibility to a city, in, including a city at Hartford at that time. And I think still true today was facing a number of transformational challenges. And that was something I saw as a massive opportunity. How do you get involved? How do you participate in this conversation? Um, so it was sort of love at first sight from that first visit. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at Trinity, I was involved in a, a number of different things, um, some, some which would, should be officially preserved in the record and probably some that probably should be stricken. But, mm -hmm. but what I loved about the on-campus life and still admire about it today is that you can be a student athlete at Trinity, you can be highly involved and you, you don't have to pick just one thing to do. You can touch lots of different things and see what inspires you and what you put in the backpack for the rest of your life journey and, and what sort of um, kind of turns you off. Um, and um, in the spirit of things that I learned um, and, and probably uh, you know influenced where I've ended up today is I, I did a rotation as an EMT through Hartford Hospital Hmm. thinking I wanted to be pre-med. I was actually mostly pre-med at Trinity. And um, that showed me that um, my calling was really in technology. I didn't want to be on that part of the care delivery system. Right. 
That's great. So um, in the Forbes article that I mentioned before, you describe a little bit about Grand Round's mission. You said, we're going to empower a lot of doctors to deliver better care. We're going to drop a lot of inefficiencies and waste out of healthcare. And if we can do that, we can obviously get better care and lower fear and anxiety about people's health and its treatment. And then potentially return wage growth to companies who are being taxed because they have to pay so much of their money for healthcare. So you said that four years ago. Tell me, how do you think it's going? Yeah, well, I'll start with the last part. I think we've made incredible progress. So, you know, my customers are Fortune 500 companies. We take care of all of their employees in this new model of healthcare that we'll talk about that we think is, is a template for, frankly, how the country uh, should think about it. And each of those companies has been able to see improvements in their healthcare outcomes, mm-hmm. reduced financial expenditure associated with those healthcare outcomes, and they are returning wage growth. And by the way, these are companies, these, these are companies like Amazon and Walmart, Target Corporation, Home Depot, right? So these are companies that sort of are, are um, operating with a lot of people at the low end side of the wage scale. And um, those are the people that my colleagues and I get most inspired to help out. That is that is what we call the 1% solution for the 99%. We can get into a little bit about um, you know, how that works. Having said that, there are tremendous challenges in front of us. You, know, you, started, you started with some opening comments, which, which I think you know I agree with, that there are real issues with equity, with access, with equality, which is related but not exactly the same concept. Um, and, and those play out um, very dramatically in the healthcare system. Um, part of it's about race, part of it is about education level, part of it is about what zip code you come from, um, who you know. And so, um, you know, we see this fundamentally as a problem or a set of problems that if you start to democratize the access and you just make it easier for people to get care at any hour of the day that they pick Mm -hmm. through any modality that's comfortable for them, you might start to see the outcomes get better. Um, And um, I'm incredibly proud of the work we've been doing in those populations and many others like them um, because it's, it's moving in the right direction. And it's something I think we should all be optimistic about. Right. So, so Owen, tell us a little bit about the model so sure. that we understand, you know, some of the statements you're making about democratization of care. So, so what is that model and hence, how is it providing more justice in our healthcare system? Yeah. So the way I describe it, and, and this will make sense given your introduction, if you are a family member of somebody inside the system, a doctor, a nurse, even a medical assistant, somebody who's got connectivity and can speak some of the language, Mm -hmm. your chances of getting a better outcome are dramatically higher. Mm -hmm. We talk about our company and our services like being the doctor in the family. You can call us whenever you want for questions big or small, you can connect through video, you can connect through chat, you can connect through text. And whether you are trying to figure out a low level question like why do I have to pay this bill or how do I get a new insurance card or how do I apply for disability and sort of these administrative concerns, Mm -hmm. or you've been diagnosed with a, a type of cancer that there are only 50 known cases in the United States and everything in between we get, we're going to be like your doctor in the family and take you all the way through the journey to a successful outcome. Um, I will say this because you know, so many of the sort of talks that I'm a part of, and I think our general orientation towards the healthcare system in America is we've got a broken system. It's expensive. It doesn't work. And I think there's certainly evidence that we are, we are under optimized, but, but I do want to share that when our system is used properly, we have the best science, we have the best technology, 
on the face of the planet, bar none. It's really a question of how do you get people to the right endpoints and connected and communicated with properly. And those sorts of things are technology problems, honestly. And that's why I was so inspired to, to tackle this. Right. You know, it's interesting because um, I think that you shared that Starbucks spends more on employee health care than they spend on beans. Yes, that's right. And so as a disruptor, you've really been able to change that equation for, um, for Starbucks? Yeah, so the, so the way it works for a Starbucks or, or um, you know, Ford spends more money on, on healthcare benefits than they do on steel to make cars. And yet in Ford's case, they have a supply chain of thousands of people making sure that the steel that they select, that the components that go into the products that they sell are of the finest quality, are inspected, work well together. Mm-hmm. And their benefits team is about a half dozen people. And so you just don't have, frankly, the level of rigor or frankly, the capacity for the level of rigor to make the, the important decisions about how to get people to the right level of care. Con- consider this for just a second. We're all going to go through a healthcare experience. I've certainly been through mine. Perhaps, Joanne, you've been through yours. Mm-hmm. Um, every time that happens, we know nothing about the quality of the provider that's going to take care of us. We don't really know how much we're going to be charged at the end of the visit. We don't really know what all the, the steps are going to be in the process uh, to figuring out and ultimately solving the problem for us. It's the only economic transaction in America where both the supplier, AKA the doctor and the consumer, AKA the patient have no idea what it's going to cost when it happens. It's mind boggling when you actually think about it. Imagine trying to buy a car that way or buy a TV. Mm -hmm. And so what Grand Rounds has done is we have set up this model so that you work on behalf of the patients. We research quality. We pair people with the highest quality providers. We add in services like telemedicine and some of the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We pair with experts to resolve the most complex Um, diagnoses and and, um, uncertain treatment paths. And that's the work that we're doing on behalf of these roughly 6 million people that we covered today. Right. Um, Owen, you alluded to the fact that you've actually used some of these services. Yeah. And I think in a, um, a discussion that we had before, you spoke about grand round saving your life. Yep. I think that's a pretty dramatic story that our our viewers would love to hear a little bit more about. So can you share? Yeah, so this was about um, three years after I co-founded the company. Um, I started to um, develop, uh, I started to lose hearing basically in my right ear. And um, I started to kind of get occasionally a little bit dizzy. And um, I went to my primary care doctor and they said, oh, this is sort of a, a typical thing. You, you probably have a cold, you have a you know, clogged ear tube and, and let's just take some Sudafed and, and we'll be fine. And after two visits that basically resolved that way, I said, I need to take this case to my company, to Grand Rounds. Mm-hmm. Almost immediately they said, this is probably more than it seems. Um, I got paired with the right medical team I got all of the studies that needed to happen and turned out I had a brain tumor, Um, which you can only imagine as the father of three very little kids Mm. um, was about the most scary thing I had ever heard in my life. But to then have the team behind me to go out and connect with literally the six leading surgeons in the world on this particular condition in the, from the comfort of my own home, review my options, understand what that treatment path was going to look like, understand what my recovery could look like or wouldn't look like, what my long-term prognosis would be, was incredible. And after a 13-hour surgery and a stay in the hospital um, and rehabilitation on how to walk uh, again and all the things that happen, um, here I am, um, you know, almost four years later, uh, doing great. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think without that team, I would have had sort of high risk complications that, that we could go into if it's interesting, but 
face could be paralyzed. Lots of stuff could have happened. Um, this is where high quality medicine really makes a difference. It, it ultimately inflects the quality of life people live afterwards. And so while I certainly didn't start the company to be my own client, that is where we ended. Um, right. and, um, and I'm proud of the work that the team does. And we make those things possible for people around the country every single day. Right. Well, it's an amazing story and I'm so glad to hear the positive outcome. Um, can you share with me a little bit where that team was? So were most of them in the San Francisco area? Yeah. You know, how, how exactly did that work? Yeah, so um, the surgeons that I consulted with, all Grand Rounds experts, were literally all over the world. And so what, what Grand Rounds has enabled, um, which is um, a remarkable thing, uh, and if, you've been, if any of us are in healthcare, you, you understand why this is remarkable. Mm -hmm. They were able to take these large uh, neuro MRI files, all my lab work, my patient history, and effectively through this secure platform, beam it around the world get multiple uh, multidisciplinary teams to look at those and, and pull back the information for me, advising on what was the sort of latest and greatest state-of-the-art um, and most evidence-based plan to pursue. Ultimately, I was able to get that care not too far away from my home, only about 70 miles away from a team that had, mm -hmm. uh, and I knew this going in, I knew exactly how many they had completed and what their outcomes were. We had right. all of that data. Um, it was healthcare the way it should be. And, uh, and so I felt tremendous confidence. My wife felt tremendous confidence going through that experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Grand Rounds as a company has grown up in taking care of people that way and also making sure that we ask all of the smaller questions, right? A brain tumor is a sort of gripping story, but you know, um, it's equally powerful when we take care of somebody who is working the overnight shift and she needs to take care of her kid in the morning and get them in to see the pediatrician and they can't figure out how to do that. And you can provide that on the on the spot consultation and give her some give her some confidence about how her kid's doing. And so those are the moments we remember. Those are the moments that a sort of great future American healthcare system I think will be founded upon. Right. Well. It's wonderful the range of services that you can provide. And, you know, it, it feels like you're not just focused on healthcare. It is a bit about making the world better and a better yeah. place. Um, and that's, as I said, very inspiring um, to me. Now, maybe I'd like to ask you questions about um, kind of the COVID pandemic that we're in right now. Have you seen a change in your business based on COVID? It, you know, I might imagine that when people don't want to leave their homes, there may be even more uses for telemedicine and some of the things that you're doing. But can you share with us a bit what what has COVID been for you and your company? For sure, and that, um, and 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 you know, so I'll share with you sort of the optimism and then stuff that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, so for sure, we've been incredibly busy. Um, you know, we went from the month of February, where about three to five percent of interactions were what we, what people would generally classify as telemedicine interactions in the broad healthcare system. Um, in March, that number was 35. In April, that number was 40. Um, you know, May data is still sort of being computed, um, but we expect it to be in the high 40s or low 50s. That's an incredible uh, change in the American uh, care delivery system. Um, telemedicine has been a thing for a long time and uh, for a variety of regulatory and other reasons, it's been hard to consume it. And most patients, if we had surveyed them in January and said, do you expect to use telemedicine this year? Would have said, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to go see Dr. Smith in person. Yeah. And now it's a reality. And so when people say the American healthcare system moves slowly, they are of course right against the pattern and clear facts of history. But boy, have we seen a revolutionary change in the last few months. And I'm sure our data looks very similar to other traditional healthcare providers. That's a positive mm -hmm. because through telemedicine, we can lower the cost of delivery. We can be more humane about it. We can lower the anxiety people have in getting to appointments and waiting in waiting rooms, which are uncomfortable mm -hmm. for appointments that never start on time and always seem too short, mm -hmm. right? All of those things will be improved upon through this new medium. And I have high confidence that we're not in a temporary moment on that. 
this is where we're going to stay. On the flip side, yeah. I am concerned that a lot of rural health systems in particular are in deep financial trouble because they relied on a lot of in-person so-called elective care. These are surgeries like knee replacements and um, uh, you know, neuro procedures and cancer mm -hmm. infusions. They, they, they rely on that work happening in person and it is almost impossible financially to make up from the deficit as you move to telehealth. And those are social safety net hospitals for millions and millions of Americans. I'm really concerned about that. Um, I'm also concerned that as we make this change, um, we run the risk of leaving some people out. Because in order to experience the telehealth of the future, you need to have good quality home um, broadband, you need to be able to speak English easily, and a variety of other considerations that, um, that I think we can work on as a country, but I don't think are obvious victories. And so I am sort of in my personal work, um, you know, with my wife, I'm super interested in the questions of how you improve access and what are the other sort of both social determinants and infrastructure level things that we need to think about uh, to make sure that the healthcare system of, of the future is, is um, as fair and equitable as it needs to be. Okay. Um, I'm sure you won't be surprised that there are a lot of parallels between what you've said and what I feel is happening in higher yeah. education or sometimes not happening in higher yeah. education. So, you know, we can, we can talk. Well, can I, can I actually, I hate to break you out of rhythm there, but can I ask you a question? Because I, I have been thinking, no, I've been thinking about this because, because, you know, as we all shuttered into our homes, you know, and I received word from the campus of, of students heading home, you know, I was thinking about you, I was thinking about the faculty, I was thinking about the staff that work at Trinity. And I was, I was curious, you know, what is your perspective um, in these moments of sort of when you have a pandemic and that threatens the ability to congregate? Like, what, how, how does Trinity grapple with that? Right. Um, that's a big question. Um, but I'm going to start by saying a few things. Um, first, I was so proud of the Trinity community on campus that pivoted on a dime to offer courses remotely. Hmm. So we recognized very early that it was best to send as many students as possible home. Once we made that decision, all kinds of people came together to make sure that that could be as successful as possible. Faculty members figured out literally with a week how to think about their courses remotely. The staff that was supporting the faculty, you know, provided services to be able to do that. But also alumni and parents provided financial assistance to us through an emergency fund that allowed us to send students home with computers, if need be, if they weren't able to, uh, you know, if they didn't have something to be able to work remotely. We were able to support people with broadband service who didn't have it to be able to take their courses. So it was without doubt a challenging time, but what I wanna share was the beauty of how a community came together to continue the education of the group of students that were here. I'm going to stop there, but maybe later we can come back and speak a little bit about what about the implications for the future yeah. of a primarily residential college? I mean, what does this mean? What does this kind of disruption mean? And how are we going to anticipate that kind of disruption in the future and still offer the personalized, highly connected education that you spoke about when you first started? But it's your interview, ah. uh, not mine. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ask another question for you. Um, so you have created now Grand Rounds, but you also 
created reputation.com. So I think you certainly count as an entrepreneur. I don't know if you get to be called a serial entrepreneur yet um, with, with two companies. You can tell me um, you know, what you think about that. But share with me how you are thinking about how you thought about launching your own venture. Like, what made you wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'm going to start my own company? Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, by the way, you were kind to only mentioned the two that, that have done well. Um, oh, there, okay. there are others that's, that that's were not as successful. Um, so, so um, you know, first of all, I think the the thing that people see or the thing that I see is I often see a fundamental moment of friction that nobody has sort of had the courage to say, what if we just broke that down? What if we broke down, um, you know, that all that calcium and scar tissue and stuff that's blocking us from moving freely and, and producing a better experience for consumers and customers. Um, and, you, and you start to, the more you stare at the thing, the more you realize that it, um, it may be possible to, if, if you just work at it. And I, and I hate to make it sound that simple, but I think too frequently we hold up entrepreneurship as if there was this magical moment. I climbed to the top of the mountain. I was handed a sort of um, a tablet and, and down I came and sort of the rest is history. It, it rarely looks like that. I know you had my friend um, Matthew Prince on last week and I think he also is a serial entrepreneur and we sort of are, we're just doggedly pursuing a better world, but, but very incrementally. Like you look at the story of Grand Rounds or Reputation.com or Cloudflare, and it can seem like there are these big bag moments, but really what was inside of them was a bunch of small decisions that we just need to do it better. Um, and so for me, I have an impatience about that. Um, and that's probably powered um, why these companies, but I also um, am very driven, you know, to, to make the world a better place and to have something that I leave behind that I'm proud of, that I can point to and say, this was my thing. I'm, I'm not an artist. Um, I'm, I'm not a poet. I'm not a sort of builder of stuff, but I think I can build teams with purpose that can attack um, the kinds of problems that, that a lot of people would agree to and point and say, gosh, I wish there was a great team working on that. Um, so that's, that's probably it more than anything else. Well, what do you think about risk taking? Do you think yeah. that's also part of the spirit that you have and, and kind of where did that come from? Can so I think happen? it didn't, well, that part definitely did not come from my family because I think that they, they were not, they both stayed in their, you know, my parents both stayed in their jobs for uh, many decades. Mm. And, um, and I think they were loving supportive parents, but I think for a little while they were like pretty concerned that, I was going to come sort of back home, hat in hand, um, asking for a free meal and, and some laundry. I did do that anyway, by the way, that happened plenty of times. But I think, I think that, you know, for me, it's not higher risk to go out and start your own team or your own company. What's the worst thing that happens if you're starting from zero and it doesn't work? You're no further behind than where you were. In fact, I was talking to a board member just the other day. I probably feel more risk now mm. at... 800 employees, 6 million covered lives, um, you know, thousands of institutional contacts and providers that we work with, that probably feels greater risk to me because we are now 24 by 7 serving people, including people who are, are newly diagnosed with COVID-19 or are under suspicion of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We can't let this not work now. When it was two guys in a coffee pot, like that wasn't <laughs> risk. I mean, I had reasonably high confidence that I could go back and, and work in Silicon Valley if I, if I needed to. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I, I kind of love about the generation coming up behind me is I see more of that willingness to, to, to take a year, to take six months, to explore something and see if it, see if it'll click in. Um, now that we could, we could spend a whole different conversation about what I think is the hardest part of the journey is once it starts going, you've got to stick with it because there are a lot of people I think that take this sort of easy path out and unfortunately, you know, fortunately or unfortunately in this country, it's very lucrative to take the easy path out. Um, 
So what's the easy path out? The easy path out is selling the company, you know, um, in it, you know, for an amount that um, would have, you know, allowed you to save everything you needed and for your grandchildren and do that before you've actually reached real scale. And, um, and, you know, I get it. Like, I'm sure there are people on this conversation today who have operated that way. There's nothing sort of dishonorable about it, but I think that the, the hard part is saying, I'm now going to do the hard work of, taking it up another level or two. Um, and I, and I, you know, admire, I have a lot of close friends who are running, you know, a lot of technology companies out here. And I think the ones I most admire are the ones that are, uh, you know, persevering through lots of complexity and difficulty right now, um, because they really believe in what their companies are all about and, and, and the change they're trying to bring. Right. Um, another question I have for you is actually based on the conversation last week with Matthew Prince. And he was saying during the COVID epidemic, where people have been working from home, he's saying increased efficiency in the organization. And in fact, is thinking about not everybody going back to work because they're so highly productive now in this a bit more work from home era. And I just wonder, have you seen something like that in the productivity of your company? Has it changed the way you might think about being you know, physically together in an office um, or more working from home? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and again, I would love to hear how you think about that. But I, I, the sort of, um, we, we were from the, from the moment in all this, so we have employees in all 50 states. Um, mm -hmm. From the moment that this all started, um, we were essential workers because our folks are actually delivering healthcare. They're mm -hmm. diagnosing, they're ordering tests, including the COVID nineteen test. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, we were, we we really didn't have an option but to continue to sort of work at work at pace. Now the transformation was how do you then do that at home rather than these facilities that we had really well built out. Um, there are still stuff that we can only do in the facilities or we have uh, a bunch of technology for sort of uh, ingesting and, and, and digitizing medical records. We have pathology um, um, capabilities, et cetera. But the majority of our people are now at home. And what I would say, and this is probably uh, more of an indication of my personality versus Matthew's is, I, I don't think that is going to continue. I think that you have seen productivity increases largely because people wanted to put on their noise canceling headphones, hunch over a keyboard and, and not think too hard about what was going on in the world. Um, I'm seeing that tide move out. People want connection. They want to feel purpose. They want to sort of get that motivation from having others around them. Um, I think we are going to see an epidemic of loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a lot of behavioral health problems in, in working America right now because there is an important role that the workplace plays in, in making sure people connect and are accountable and live their best selves every day. It becomes too easy to not do that. Um, um, it, it becomes easy to start watching, you know, one Netflix show, then two, then three. Um, and, um, and, and that's not great for our business for sure, but it's not great for those people either. And so, um, and so my prediction is we will get back together. Having said that we have our, our San Francisco location is closed until October. Um, wow. our, um, main in Nevada facilities are, um, in the process of reopening and they've had, they've had staff there throughout. Right. Yeah. It, you can imagine it's a little bit more complicated in higher education. One, it is so clear that our students feel that being together and learning together is part of the experience. Yeah. So, you know, we recently did a survey of our parents and students and 85% say, I want to be back on campus in the fall. Yeah. And I would say then another 12% say, we'll be back as long as it's safe. And only very few people are not interested in coming back and being together physically. Now, 
you know, I feel a little bit like you that there's, there's so much that you gain from interacting with other people. But I'm also thinking about the other side and that there may be some of our operations, not necessarily the teaching per se, but some of the other functions that we do that may be able to happen as well from home as they are physically. And I weigh that with perhaps the commuter expense, not just for the individual, but sure. also for the environment when you're driving back and forth all yeah. the time. So, Good. you know, in a very um, educational fashion, I might say, I think what we want to do is put together a committee or task force to study work at home a little bit better so that we understand that balance between productivity and some of the other um, things that you might gain from, from working from home. So I don't have a great answer for you because there's so many aspects of our operation. You know, it's, uh, we, sometimes I say we, we are, have most of the functions of a little city. Uh, you know, from healthcare to education to athletics, you know, we're just a very complicated organization. And it may be that some parts of our organization can function um, from work at home, or at least a balance of coming in um, and being at home and others that is so clear that you need the face-to-face -face interactions to, to do well. Absolutely. And during, you know, in during this interstitial period, as we get to sort of, you know, my prediction would be we have two or three reasonably effective, um, you know, therapies for treating COVID-19, especially at the earlier stages. Mm -hmm. We have remdesivir, I already identified. I believe there will be a couple more by the end of the year. And then, but I think the clock to a, to a vaccination is, well longer than anybody is estimating. And, um, you know, that, that sort of comes from that. That's the opinion of, frankly, a lot of the folks that we work with on RNA vaccines um, and related. And the point I'm making in sort of offering those guideposts is the time period where you and I will have to manage that flow is probably longer than one or two even academic years. Mm -hmm. And it's Right. It's very, it's a complex topic because the, the students are going to feel with, frankly, lots of epidemiological evidence that they are at very low to no risk. Yeah. But your staff, I suspect, right. will not feel that way. And your faculty will not feel that way because you have much more age variants and you probably have a lot of other sort of conditional risk. And if they have to take public transportation to get there, we know that that is a risk. Um, in transmission. We also know that the shared services continue to be a risk, although the data on that is sort of uh, more optimistic of late. And so, you know, I, I sort of want to acknowledge the complexity of the decision that you're going to have to make um, and sort of, um, I guess, thank you in advance for the leadership that I'm sure you'll th show through it. Um, for what it's worth, I do think um, there are really good sort of um, you know, resources in the private sector now who are who are putting together these blueprints for how to make this work. And, and we're doing a lot of that work at Grand Rounds as we return AT&T to work and Tyson mm -hmm. Foods to work and all these companies that are sort of thinking through these moments mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, additional complexity. Um, I don't mean to make this a political statement. Unfortunately, it'll probably come across that way. But there is an absence of federal uh, sort of direction on these topics. The CDC was too slow to, to publish guidelines here. And so it's, le it's, it's leaving those decisions to people like you and me who, right, you know, I didn't, in, in my CEO camp, I didn't learn, I missed the class on global pandemics. And I don't know if you attended that one and, and you're, well, you know, in your, in your college president uh, camp, right. but I have to share with you, though, Owen, I do have a master's in public health from UC Berkeley, okay. <laughs> and my PhD um, is Fair from enough. Bloomberg School of, of uh, Public Health at Johns Hopkins, so I had a little bit. Okay, so you, all right, so you have, <laughs> yes, and you also have the neuroscientific background, too, to sort of put together the cognitive distortion that we're all experiencing, so maybe I, sh I should be interviewing you right now. Why are you interviewing me? <laughs> no, it, it, it but... I think we're going back and forth because you are 
talking about the challenges and and you know the the difficulties in deciding what to do in the fall. But the one statement I want to make is that this pandemic has brought together college presidents, college and university presidents, in a way that I have never seen before. People are getting on Zoom calls and sharing honestly and frankly what they're thinking about, batting ideas back and forth in a way that I had never seen before, you know, at least in my, um, you know, six years of being a president right. before. And it's going all the way from, you know, the community colleges and the little ones all the way to Yale University. And everybody's getting on the same phone calls and sharing their experiences. And once again, that sense of community, there, that, those are some of the positive aspects that are coming out of even something as challenging as um, a global pandemic. So um, I, I'm going to ask a, a few more questions. I, I can't believe our time is, is going so quickly. I want to speak a little bit about your time at Trinity College and try and get in a little bit about your education and, and kind of how it's laid perhaps the groundwork for what you're doing. So you were a Spanish major, is that correct? Um, and can you tell me how you think that informed the experiences that you're having now? Because excuse me, a lot of people will say, oh, you majored in a language, well, what are you going <laughs> yes. to do with that? <laughs> I wouldn't say that a lot of people say that. Everybody says that. Everybody so, um, so, so again, I give, so I give my parents credit for supporting what probably didn't seem like an obvious pre-professional decision. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about just briefly why I did that, but also make the sort of non-obvious connection to what I've done subsequently. Um, so I came to Trinity and one of the things that sort of sealed the deal for me was, uh, and I don't know if this still exists, but there was something called the guided studies program, which was this intensive um, deep soak in uh, European civilization. It was kind of the great books plus um, uh, uh, sort of a very rigorous uh, um, discovery and discussion about certain periods of time. And um, it was both sort of one of the hardest things I've ever done academically and also one of the most fulfilling. Um, through that process, um, I got to um, start to meet some of the faculty in the languages department, and I thought they were terrific. And I picked, I almost picked sort of the faculty and the teaching environment and the classroom experience more than I picked the stuff. Because as I mentioned, I did most of the pre-med uh, curriculum, and I, I was all over the college quite literally, but I really loved sort of the home I felt in the languages and humanities. Um, now, what's interesting about language specifically, which is different than um, history or philosophy or political science, is you know, language at some level is both a way to connect with each other. You and I are using English and we're connecting, but it's also computational. And, um, and, and, and I am sort of, most of my career has been in technology, almost all my career has been in technology subsequently. Uh, you know, it started the data science team at, at eBay. Um, data science was power, what, what made reputation.com have its competitive advantage. Um, and, and really what I love about language is it's very lo logical, it's very computationally driven and the process by learning how to communicate with other people is actually about sort of um, understanding the syntax um, and flow and communication between people. So it's really the sort of love of that faculty and that teaching environment but also this notion that um, it was challenging a part of my brain that ultimately felt challenged when I went on to study computer science and um, start writing code and, and all the things I did later. So, um, you know, I guess, my, I guess what I would say at a minimum, if I were talking to students um, on this call, which I know I'm not, um, is you know, the, the undergraduate degree is really not as predictive of what you're gonna do in the future as I think everybody makes it out to be. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, employers, and we employ a lot of people, including a bunch of new college grads, we're really not so much looking for 
what you did as the story of why you did it and what you're going to take away and how you think you would apply that to the problems of today and tomorrow. Um, so Spanish was that for me, for sure. Right. And, you know, something that you're sharing that I think I've heard in a lot of stories of people who've gone through Trinity College is people making unusual connections. Sometimes it's that some of our students are triple majors, which in some ways blows my mind. I, I think, how can you do that many things? But you're talking about a Spanish major, but you were clearly doing a lot of the pre-med courses. Yeah. And similarly, you know, as we said last week when we were um, speaking to Matthew Prince, he had been an English major and computer science minor in yeah. essence. So, which, awesome. which, right? I mean, this is what I think is particularly special about a liberal arts education, but there's something in the water, I almost want to say at Trinity College, that I have seen those disparate connections happen more frequently here than even some of the other liberal arts institutions that I've been affiliated with, you know, and people yeah. make just really interesting combinations. And I, I'm not sure I understand the why behind it, but it's just a part of so many stories um, that I've heard. But, you know, one other question I want to ask in terms of, you know, Trinity, we know it's a fantastic liberal arts college. But you also spoke a little bit about it being in the city and mm -hmm. an urban setting. So tell me how and if you connected with the city and how you think that influenced kind of what Trinity is, or at least your experience. I mean, I did completely. And I'll tell you sort of um, how that landed for me. Um, one, the fact that it was not just a city, but it was also a state capital meant mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. government and business relating to government was happening there. So the quality of the internships um, and the quality of the sort of uh, conversations you could witness and the people who were willing to take a call from a student was um, pretty incredible. I, I remember sort of now, I, I remember being very struck by sort of how accessible a lot of those people were and how eager they were to help um, college students. Trinity is a gem of Connecticut and having that in the, in right there where they were sort of coming up to do their work was pretty incredible. Hartford Hospital, as you know, is also a pretty amazing place. It's the largest health system in Connecticut and um, and does some pretty incredible work. It's both an academic health hospital as well as a um, serving a very diverse and complex community. And so getting access to that um, was super interesting uh, to me as well. Not to mention the fact that I just think socially, or more social awareness, being in a city and right next to a neighborhood that was challenging. I don't know that Trinity's record at my time and perhaps even today was perfect on this front, but at least was some awareness of the real world, right? And um, an and awareness that sort of not everybody had the things that I had or was experiencing the same things that I had. Um, we had we were just bringing up the learning corridor that was all happening while while I was at Trinity, um, uh, so seeing that sort of capital development project to the you know, public-private partnership, that was all really, really cool. Um, and so, you know, I loved that sort of fusion and connection and, and Hartford was not New York, so it wasn't huge. Right. Um, so it was sort of accessible um, in, in that sense. So for me, it was um, a really important part of, of how I thought about campus life and would commend it to people still do for, for, for that reason, because I think it gives people the best of both worlds. Right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it reminds me a little bit of um, a book or an, the author is Brian Stevenson. Yeah. And the book and the movie is um, Just Mercy. Yeah. And one of the things that he shared is the importance of staying human by interacting with people who are very different from you. That it's so easy to go live in your suburb and forget that, you know, even as we've seen in the last week and a half, 
that some people are constantly living under the fear of interacting with, you know, police in their community and, and whether they're going to go out and be safe. But there is something about Trinity's location that you cannot forget. That's right. There is a reality around. And I say to people, you know, when you walk across the street off of Trinity's campus, you better have your bearings around you right. because you need to know what's going on. You don't want to get hit by a car. You don't want, yep. uh, you know, you, you have to pay attention to what's going on. And I think that does provide a kind of education that's hard to quantify. And it's right. not as big as New York City. And you can get more involved in the city in a very different way when it's Hartford versus even Boston. So, you know, the, the way that you articulated that has made me very proud. Thank you. Well, I just, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I would just underscore everything you just said. I mean, you and I have had this comment back for when I first met you, like, I want, I hope my, my dream for the college would be that we lean into that, not shy away from it. And there are plenty of reasons that we get in feedback why we should shy away from it. But, mm -hmm. but I think it's such an incredible opportunity and so differentiated from, uh, from the other colleges. And I will just, well, I just want to plug Brian Stevenson for a second. If you're not familiar with the author <laughs> she just mentioned, I had the opportunity to have dinner with him a couple years ago. He is an incredible guy. And if you want to learn a lot about this current moment in history and understand what, where, how it came to be, I would, I would recommend reading his stuff. Right. That's terrific. And um, I agree with you. Uh, glad that I could mention it. The one last thing I will make a plug for is when you spoke about internships and the fact that we're in a city, um, I do want to share with you this budding partnership that we have with Infosys, the global technology company that opened a hub here in Hartford and that we were able to partner with them. We currently have a new summer co course called Tech Edge where we want people who have liberal arts backgrounds but are interested in jobs and technology to provide a bridge between their liberal arts training and some of the technology jobs in the future. And we are doing that in partnership with Infosys because they are here with a hub in Hartford. So um, there are just so many incredible opportunities. And I can only hope that uh, Trinity College continues to educate people like you, Owen. Thank you, that's kind. Thank you. Um, any final word that you wanna share? Because we are one minute before the end of the hour. I'll let you have the last word. I think the last word I have, just sort of putting my public health hat at, on is that um, be careful um, take care of each other. Um, we have a we have a lot of responsibility to each other in this moment, and I think one of the most important moments uh, responsibilities is is sort of um, listening and learning and taking action on information. So I I'm glad to reconnect with my college, and I hope you will stay connected with each other. Absolutely, it's a promise. Awesome. All right, thank you, and best to you and your family and your parents, the doctors. That's right. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye -bye. Okay. Thank you.